I remember these words penned by the prophet Isaiah. So I will gather all nations and peoples together, and they will see my glory. I will perform a sign among them, and I will send those who survive to be messengers to the nations, to Tarshish, to the Libyans, to the Lydians, who are famous as archers, to Tubal and Greece, and to all the lands beyond the sea that have not heard of my fame or seen my glory. They will declare my glory to the nations. They will bring the remnant of your people back from every nation. What a wonderful Old Testament word of hope for the future on this day of Advent when we celebrate hope. I think when we think about the subject of hope in the Old Testament, in the days when Isaiah penned those words, there was a, a model, there was a, an ethnic group, there were a chosen people called the Israelites. And they were to represent the goodness of God, the graciousness of God, the kindness, the, the welcoming of God. But here we are on the other side of Jesus' arrival, his life, his death, his resurrection and ascension. And we're a part of not a model of one ethnic group, but we are a model of this prophecy, this prophecy of the nations, those that survived, that took the missions to all of the different places. We're the church. We're the church of Jesus Christ. And, and I think, if I may say this so boldly, that the international church is, is a kind of picture of what Isaiah was talking about when he spoke of the hope to come. It's the hope of being able to look at each other and, as Debbie said, the beauty of coming to a, a dinner, a church, a gathering where you hear accents from all over the world. And you see people from all over the world, young, old. I spoke with a little child this morning, or actually he spoke with me and said, how about some money? I'm, I'm collecting money for my, well, I wasn't quite sure what it was because his mother just kind of said, oh no, that's, that's, the, that's the Canadian guy here. He doesn't have any kroner. And it was true, all I have is France euros now. But what a beautiful picture of hope these days that we can gather together in this beautiful country of Norway, full of fjords and salmon and all kinds of one, this beautiful picture of what the international church is about. I'd like to explain to you a little bit of my own journey and hopefully encourage you about where you are and, and the journey that God has called you on. How many of you recall when you were a child and you sat in the back seat of the car and, and you said something like, Dad, are we there yet? Are we, are we arriving? And you, you didn't really know the journey, but you knew that you're in the car and you were going somewhere, or whether that was a destination of you know, choice or vacation or whatever it was, but you didn't really know the journey. Sometimes, sometimes, as we gather together, even as internationals, the explanation of the journey is one that's just, well, I can't say anything but inspiring. And that as we kind of understand the fullness of the hope that Jesus brings to us in this expression of his bride, it, it just sort of solidifies our faith and response to the words that Debbie's saying, thank you for your faithfulness. He's always been faithful to me. Often people will ask, well, could we hear Debbie sing again? And she is. She's going to sing again. Instead of responding to the, this message this morning by singing, Debbie's going to come at the conclusion of the service and sing a blessing over you. She'll invite you to stand and bless you as you hopefully get another piece of understanding to the journey that God has called you to be a part of. For some, 
A journey might be more enticing if you heard it even described with the word adventure. I love that one. I'm kind of an adventure junkie. And the idea of hiking in Norway just gets me all excited. Hopefully we'll get to go on a hike this afternoon or tomorrow. But I want to take you to a passage of scripture that has inspired the international church and our calling with David and with North Sea over the years. And it's Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. It, we'll put it on the screen in the back, and you can just have a look at it as I give you some preliminary or contextual comments to this. How many of you know when I say the phrase Great Commission, what that means? Just raise your hand, would you? Great Commission. Okay, let me just remind you that in the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus gave a last commandment that we often call the Great Commission. And if I could summarize it in two Bible words, it would simply mean make disciples. He said it different ways in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then it was repeated for a fifth time in the eighth verse of the first chapter of the book of Acts. And it goes like this. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you'll be witnesses in, can you say it with me? Jerusalem, Judea. What's the next one? Samaria and the uttermost part of the world, or the ends of the earth. And that sort of picture is a, is a circle that starts with the local city, and it gets wider and wider and wider. That verse, verse 8, is the kind of thesis verse for the entire 28 chapters of the book of Acts. But you know, the disciples and the Jesus followers in that day were no different than you or I. How many of you would admit, no hands showing please, but how many of you would admit that sometimes it takes a while for you to understand what God is telling you to do? Or that perhaps sometimes our response to God is delayed, or we don't get the whole picture. And it was just like that for the disciples. In the very first two chapters of this book, boy, God was all about inviting people onto this journey or into the adventure of taking the name of Jesus and proclaiming who he was to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. But you know the disciples then, why at Pentecost, all the nations were gathered. And languages were spoken there from all kinds of different places. One of the first indications that God really meant what he was talking about regarding this invitation to journey or this opportunity, this welcome into adventure. Well, they, the disciples then began and the, and the, and the word began to, to move back into those countries where those languages were spoken. A little bit later on in the book of Acts, there was persecution that broke out. And again, the word began to travel outside those circles of borders or those places. But there was one place in the book of Acts where the local church like this actually kind of got or caught what Jesus said when he when he declared or proclaimed or commanded, make disciples. The church in Antioch is often referred to as a place where they were first called Christians. But I like to look at it a little bit differently, and I want to show you from this text why. I think there's a case to be made for this church to be called the first international church. Here's the background to these three verses. Jerusalem, 400 kilometers south of Antioch, where the people, the followers of Jesus, had some of them literally heard the words of Jesus make disciples. We're worshiping, we're gathering. But they didn't seem to catch the implication or the command as good as or as full as those that were gathering in this city called Antioch. Let's pause for a moment and just let me tell you about Antioch. It was a huge capital place of commerce. 
Lots of Roman roads connected to this city. It was a place where a common language called Greek would have been used, not Aramaic or, or any other language, but Greek would have been used to keep the commerce going in that city. And it's in this city, as we will, and you can already see on the, on the screen behind me, it's on this city where some amazing things started happening in what I love to call the first international church. Why was it amazing? Let's read the text and I'll explain. Among the prophets and teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, Lucius from Cyrene, Manian, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas, and Saul. And there's the membership roster for the first international church. We'll go through it in a minute. One day, as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work I have for them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. New Testament scholar N.T. Wright describes the city of Antioch with as many as 18 ethnic enclaves. Those are his words. It would have been much easier for the church to have been birthed or described or developed in 18 different ways. But somehow, this group of mentioned men, these five people, figured out, watch this, that the Jews and the Gentiles could meet together under one roof. And this, brothers and sisters, was scandalous. It had never been done. There was great tension and argument over Jesus' words, make disciples, and what that meant, but Antioch got it. This group of people had figured out the gospel is bigger than one ethnic group like the Old Testament. This group had figured out that, that the gospel was for everyone. That message of hope that Isaiah had spoken centuries earlier, it was now for everyone. All colors, sizes, shapes, nationalities. And they had got it. Not only that, they had moved from simply sort of having potluck Thanksgiving dinners. How about that? They'd moved from that kind of fellowship into prayer and fasting together and asking God, how do we make disciples, not just in Antioch, Jerusalem, not just in Judea or Samaria, Syria or the world around, but how do we make disciples of all nations? And they had figured out one very significant answer that we're going we're to worship together Jews and Gentile. Not only was it fellowship, but they began to understand what it meant to be evangelistic, to carry the good news, to proclaim the good news together. And, and it wasn't just in the city of commerce where lots of internationals would come and go, but they decided, no, we've got to move from fellowship to evangelism to a missional expression of what the gospel is all about. And after they prayed and fasted, they sent Barnabas and Saul in this text, but later on in the book of Acts, how many of you remember, Saul's name was changed from Saul to Paul. So here's the journey, brothers and sisters. Here's the adventure that God invites you into. Let's look at some of these characters for a moment. Barnabas, the first one. How many of you remember the name Barnabas from the scriptures? We've only been here a short time, Debbie and I, but I want to tell you very frankly, your church has lots of Barnabases. I don't just mean male Barnabases. I mean people that are described like Barnabas was in chapter 11, people that are filled with the grace of God and the fullness of the Spirit of God. 
Barnabas, if you will, was kind of the spiritual mentor, the more mature follower of Jesus. He was the one that had been sent from Jerusalem up to Antioch to kind of check out this scandalous gathering of Jews and Gentiles moving from fellowship to evangelism to missional expressions. And who did he take with him? Look, look at the text behind me. He took a man called Saul. Do you remember what had happened? Why he was called Saul? What had happened previous to this part of the story of the development of the church? Saul was this zealot, this highly educated Jewish man with an incredible lineage and credibility and all this, and he was present at the stoning of Stephen. Can you imagine what it would have felt like to have Barnabas walk in the back door with Saul? Just to add to this scandalous conversation about what was going on with Jews and Gentiles meeting? Surely, brothers and sisters, there would have been people and there is evidence of this later on in the book of Acts, that there were people like, who's, who's Barnabas hanging out with? Why is he with that guy? But aren't you glad today that God takes us just the way we come to him? Somebody say amen to that. God takes us. He receives us. He welcomes us any way we come. Because of Barnabas' encouragement to Saul, this persecutor, why his name was changed to Paul. And this, brothers and sisters, was the first of four missionary journeys through the book of Acts. Because someone full of grace, full of the Holy Spirit, was confident enough in the call of God on a man that had met Jesus on the road to Damascus and called him into this church setting, if you will, this synagogue setting where Jews and Gentiles had figured out this is what Jesus meant when he said, make disciples. That's two of the characters in our story about the first international church. But, but look at the next one. Simeon called the black man. Some have said that could this have possibly been the same man that carried the cross of Jesus? There's no empirical or conclusive evidence about that, but, but maybe, who knows? But the point is that right here in the text, you have this description. Dr. Luke, who wrote Acts, the intentional description that people of different color culture, language, were gathered in this church that got it. Let me fast forward and make this statement so you can ponder it. Why did missions happen out of a church with the composition of different people? The international church. I'm not sure we can answer it, but it sure makes for an inspiring story. Let me say this for you personally. This is the journey. This is the invitation. This is the welcome that God says, I've got, a, I've got plans for you if you want to say yes. I've got plans for you if you want to join this international group and be a part of something that's, we said it in the interview, bigger than ourselves. Look at the next character. I love talking about this guy. Manian. Manian. As far as I understand, this is the only time his name is ever said or written in Scripture. In this translation, the description says, the childhood companion of King Herod Antipas. I'm looking at your faces. When we read the name Herod, what happens inside? You have good, fuzzy, warm feelings? Or was, or was Herod a bad guy? He, he was a bad guy. All of the Herods, there's a bunch of them. 
But Herod was a bad guy. When we look at this passage and we, and we think about the church, the international church, people come from all kinds of backgrounds. And once again, it simply doesn't matter where you've come from, what label you've had, what, what country, what religion label is across you know, your heritage. Because you don't just become a Christian because you're born in a Christian home. Any more than walking into McDonald's makes you a hamburger. You can have a hamburger in McDonald's. You can come to church, but it doesn't make you a Christian. It is a choice. It is a decision. And obviously somewhere in, in this Manian's background, born with a silver spoon in his mouth, with all of the wealth and opportunity and privilege, this gentleman, Manian, said no to the world. I'm going to follow this group this international church, this bunch of people that are doing something new under the grace, under the goodness, under the welcome of God. I'm going to follow that. I, you know, I, I just have to say this. I can't wait when we all get to heaven to meet this guy. I'd love to hear the rest of his story. How did you say no to all of the opportunity you would have had growing up with all of that privilege? But somewhere in his heart, and aren't you glad that somewhere in your heart, in your past, in your history, you said no to that and yes to Jesus. Somebody say amen to that. It's, a, it's again, the kindness, the beauty, the gentleness, the warmth, the welcome, the invitation of God into the journey of your life with other fellow believers from different countries to be a part of something, sending people out and being a part of the big story of God. Let's keep going. Lucius. Lucius is a Greek name. Clearly not Jewish. Who knows? Greek merchant, businessman in this city of commerce. But, but his name there is, his name is there to tell us that, that uh, why, by, why we have this Jew-Gentile um, difference. And Saul. One day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the, whole, the Holy Spirit said... Dedicate Barnabas and Saul. So evidently, Barnabas and the, the now developing changed reputation of Saul, who had been brought into the circle, became the very one that would be called to, sent, to be sent out and begin these mission journeys. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands on them and sent them on their way. I have three brief applications, and then Debbie's going to come and bless you. Bless you, North Sea, because you've already been a part of the international church and how it works in Scripture. See, there's really, there's really nothing new about what we're doing. While it's exciting with David to be interviewed and talk about what's going on, it's really nothing new. God's, God's had this plan for a long The first one was nearly 2,000 years ago. We're just doing what was already described in Scripture and figuring out how do we do this in Sao Paulo. How do we do this in Oslo? How do we find people and create elder boards and, and work through denominational issues or whatever it is to make it happen so that others can be invited into the journey, into the adventure, to be a part of the international church, not just surviving, but thriving into the future, bringing Jesus to the, to the nations. Missiologist Roger Greenway said, if we want to go to the nations, and indeed we do, we must go first to the cities. And to the cities, the international church will go. Three very simple applications. First, I've said it already, but let me say it again. Thank you. Thank you, North Sea, for your courageous effort, time, and, and funds that you've invested in David and Scotty, so that David could be the executive director of the international, the Missional International Church Network worldwide. Your permission, your empowerment to him as a leader is helping bring little Asap, young Sally, Lebanese couples, Latino people. It will result in people around the globe 
saying yes to Jesus because of what North Sea is already doing. Thank you for your financial contributions. I, I don't know the details of all that. I've just been doing ministry long enough to know that David being the executive director is, is related to, and it's, it's a part of what North Sea is about. And I'm, I, I hope that you can feel the sincerity in my voice and you can accept this gratitude for your part in the international church globally. Secondly, let me encourage you. Let me encourage you that today, as I've been attempting to describe this as a journey, as an adventure, that you can have a part in this. You can pray, and as David has referred, when you watch these videos, maybe now, uh, having visited here, there's just a little bit broader or larger picture of what's going on in the international church outside the world, outside in the rest of the world. Maybe there's, maybe there's more understanding, or you could pray more, or you, could, you can continue to move in that direction and, 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 and consider other international churches that are perhaps being planted or need help or some kind of encouragement. And the last thing, I simply want to invite you. I want to invite you to acknowledge, to realize, to understand and accept the invitation of God's journey to you, God's adventure for you. This is an opportunity to say yes to something that is bigger than yourself, that is grander than, our, than North Sea. It is God's vision. And I want to just say that when you say yes to that kind of an invitation, that, that is, as Debbie's saying, he has always been faithful to me. When we accept that invitation and God wants to bless and carry you into that journey, well, I tell you, dear friend, if you're at the beginning of that journey, considering that journey, or you've been a part of it for a long, long time, to realize where you are in that and understand there is something that just makes your soul go, wow, thank you, God, for that welcome. Debbie, come and bless us. Would you stand and simply, why, you could close your eyes, you can keep your eyes open, you can open your hand, whatever you want to do, but hear this blessing over you this morning, North Sea. And when she's finished singing, David will come and close the service.